Welcome, everybody. Uh, who here banks online? Anybody drive a car? Use a blender? Any government services? Anybody use any of those? Participate in elections? What do all those things have in common? Software. Software. Exactly right. As a matter of fact, everything you care about in your life is controlled by software. Your finances, your government, your social life, your health, everything. Space shuttle, all software. Unfortunately, we're not very good at writing software securely. Uh, my name's Jeff Williams. I've been in software security for a little over 25 years. I helped to start OWASP. You all may have used some of my projects like WebGoat, the OWASP Top 10, ASVS, uh, ISAPI, and a number of other ones. But none of that worked. <laughs> we are still in pretty dire straits in terms of our ability to write secure code. So uh, I am actively trying to push the envelope <laughs> and figure out something that will work. So today I want to talk to you about uh, runtime protection. I think it's an incredibly interesting alternative to the things we've tried so far. Actually, I, we were in what I call an era of digital security. So when I think of this, I, I mean uh, like the way that companies have digitally transformed their business. Anybody doing digital transformation efforts in their company? A couple? That's shocking. <laughs> uh, you are, if you don't know. Uh, you're probably digitally transforming your business. You're turning it into software. Uh, Mark Andreessen said software is eating the world. That's essentially what he meant. And uh, we haven't transformed the work of security into software. But that's what has to happen. We need to make it massively more efficient. So I think of sort of three waves that we've been through of AppSec. So in the early days uh, when OWASP was getting started, it was manual code reviews, manual pen tests, I love manual code review. I, uh, I, it's, uh, I don't know. It's a weird kind of personality, but it's actually uh, incredibly powerful. But it doesn't scale at all. Then from like the mid-2000s to like uh, 2020, we had an era of what I'll call the security process era. It was focused on did you do a bunch of activities, but not really on the outcomes that we care about. Like is your software actually more secure? So uh, I, I feel like uh, you know a lot of good work during that time, but it hasn't really made any difference. When I started uh, OWASP back in 2001, uh, we were finding roughly 24 and a half vulnerabilities per app. Anyone know what the average number of vulnerabilities per app today is? No, it's like 35. I mean, I'm not counting all the false positives that your static tools find, so there's that. Um, but we really haven't made a lot of progress. Like, we're not dramatically more secure today than we were 20 years ago. And I love, there's lots of smart people doing lots of incredibly brilliant things in AppSec, but we haven't made a difference. So that's our challenge. Um, so I want to talk, or challenge you here, there's a little uh, audience participation section. So. You've got some options when it comes to making your software trustworthy. And I want to ask you, which of these techniques would you trust? Would you trust your business with? Would you trust your life with? Would you trust your social life to? Would you trust your health care to or your mom's health care? First one is people using application security testing tools to make the right fixes and keep your software secure. Is that, is that good enough? You're like, okay, it was somebody tested it with a static tool, so we're good. Anybody think that's good enough? Uh, interactive testing is good, but it's not perfect. Like, I don't know, it's, I don't know. It's uh, a lot closer. But that's, I'm not here to talk about IAS, so <laughs> I'd be happy to do that later. Um, so that's, that's one choice. The other choice that you have is, using perimeter defenses to make your code safe. Anybody want to trust their healthcare to a, a WAF? Okay, I got a WAF vendor over here. Uh, <laughs> also probably not good enough. Why, you know, WAFs have a lot of issues. I'll, I'll talk about some of them in a little bit, but these are your two choices. You can either try to coerce the developers to do 
secure coding. And you can use whatever techniques you want. You can use AST tools, you can use policy, you can use training, you can use threat modeling or architecture reviews or whatever process you want to use to try to coerce the developers to do the right thing. I guarantee you I have tried them all. And I don't think they really, they're not really effective. The, the results prove that they're not effective. So we need to do something different. So today I'm going to talk about a third alternative called runtime protection. Uh, and so I'll just throw this out there as a placeholder. We're going to define it and we're going to talk about how it works and what it does. Uh, so the first thing you need to know is, actually it's not the first thing, I just threw this up because there's nowhere else, where else to put this. Uh, runtime protection is approved. It's listed in OWASP 853. It's in the NIST uh, application security, uh, minimum application security testing standard. It's part of PCI standard. It's, it's been out for a while. There's a number of RASP vendors, uh, including my company, but we're just one of, of many. Uh, the other thing is that lots of organizations are adopting RASP. Uh, if you haven't tried it or used it, you really should uh, investigate it. This is a Forrester study that says over 80% of organizations are either adopting or planning to adopt runtime protection in 2023. Okay, so that's out of the way. Um, let's talk about what it actually is. So anybody know what ASLR and DEP are for? No? Yeah. What? Is, what? That's exactly right. And why do we need to randomize our address spaces? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, so when we, we do ex ex exploit a buffer overflow, the exploit will have a, a jump to some user control, but they won't know where to jump, right? So we randomize the addresses and they can't jump to their shell code. Uh, DEP works similarly. DEP just defines some sections of memory and says this memory is not executable. Right? Those two mechanisms are really powerful. Back in the mid-2000s when OWASP was getting started, we were overrun with kernel exploits. Every week there was a new terrible flaw in some operating system. And it's not like we all of a sudden got better at programming in C and C++. What happened was we introduced ASLR in depth, and then in this first in Windows and then later in other operating systems, but it radically changed the risk calculus for buffer overflow exploits. Uh, made a huge difference. So the question is, can we do the same thing for web app and web API vulnerabilities like SQL injection and XXE and expression language injection and unsafe deserialization? How can we harden the stack so that those vulnerabilities, even if the developer makes a mistake, that vulnerability doesn't kill us? Seems like a reasonable third alternative, right? That's what runtime protection is all about. So let's talk about web apps and web APIs. So imagine this is your stack, right? You've got a runtime platform, a bunch of libraries there, like your Java, JRE or CLR. You've got your app API server, which runs on that. App uh, framework on top of that, more libraries. You've got open source libraries that use more libraries and all their dependencies. Uh, and then at the top layer, you've got your custom code. As a side note, when you actually analyze this, and look at what code actually runs, two-thirds of the code that runs is your custom code. The other one-third is the libraries. Almost all this library code doesn't ever run. It doesn't even ever load into memory. So I just want to try to get you focused on where the problems are. Um, so don't think that this is like an iceberg. People say 80% of your software, 90% of your software is open source. It's very misleading because the iceberg is upside down. Anyway. Okay, back to the main story. Uh, this is your stack, and see those little skulls there? The skulls indicate dangerous code. <laughs> Some powerful function. Might be an XML parser, or a SQL engine, or a deserialization engine, or uh, I mean, any, uh, any of the kinds of vulnerabilities that you think of, they're all run through these dangerous functions. Like maybe it's the, the way you start a native process in that framework. Those functions are all completely unprotected. Developers can use them however they want. There's no guardrails, no warnings, no developer documentation on how to use them safely. I spent many years on the Java servlet spec team trying to get them to add some warnings to the Java doc for you know, the servlet spec and for the, uh, you know, the 
SQL spec and so on, just put a warning and say, don't pass untrusted data in here. No, they won't do it. So we're, we're kind of screwed, right? If there's documentation about this, it's at OWASP, where no developer's ever gonna see it. It's not right in their IDE saying, hey, dude, or lady, don't use this with unsafe data. So what can we do about that? Well, runtime protection can add trust boundaries to those dangerous functions. We're gonna use a proven technology called instrumentation. It's the same technique that tools like AppDynamics and New Relic use to instrument apps for performance. We can instrument these applications for security and we can enhance these dangerous functions with some trust boundaries that says, hey, no untrusted data comes through here. Checks like that. Let's, so, um, let's take a look at uh, how these work. We're gonna look at two kinds of uh, checks that these trust boundaries can make. One is they can warn developers when developers use that code unsafely. So if developers are uh, trying to deserialize an untrusted XML document, you could put a check there to make sure doc type processing is turned off. Uh, we'll go through a bunch of examples. Uh, we can also use this in production to identify when attackers are trying to exploit that function. We'll look at those in, in detail, so I just wanna lay that out. Is there's kind of two use cases for runtime protection, one in development, one in production. So let's talk about SQL injection, since it's one of the leading AppSec problems. Maybe we can solve it. Uh, I want you to imagine your application here, you got a bunch of custom business logic, maybe uh, you know hundreds or thousands of queries in your application, and they connect to the MySQL library. There's some functions inside that MySQL library that actually connect to the database. Uh, that might be a good place to, to start thinking about this problem. So how would we solve this problem traditionally if we've got developers with uh, queries that they haven't set up properly? We might tell them, hey, go parameterize all your queries or escape the data before you append it into a query. But we're probably gonna make some mistakes because it might be thousands of queries. And sometimes those data flows are really complicated. So it's not obvious that you're concatenating untrusted data into a query. If you're using an ORM, you might not even be close to the code where the query is actually getting generated. So uh, this is a difficult problem because we're trying to solve it in the wrong place. Imagine we use runtime protection and we put some trust boundaries directly into that fu dangerous function. So now we can check, uh, did the developers use unsafe da untrusted data in the query? Is the, and we can also check uh, libraries here. We can say, is this SQL library up to date? Like does it have known vulnerabilities in it? And we can check, is that SQL library being misused by attackers? So instead of trying to fix a thousand places in the code, we can put those trust boundaries in the right place inside the SQL library where they belong. Everybody with me so far? Okay, I'll push on. Uh, let's see what it looks like in code. Sorry if you're not a developer, this is, uh, maybe this will help some people understand what we're doing here. This is actually some code from the MySQL library. And it's pretty simple. This is the execute query method. It takes a string as a SQL query. And it, it starts out with uh, you know, some code figuring out the connection and so on. What we wanna do is we wanna inject some code that enhances this method with a trust boundary. We can make it pretty simple. We can say, hey, uh, enforce SQL trust boundary here and we'll pass in some, some data from within this method. Then we can sit, like, let, ask like, what does that method do? Okay, this is a, a check we can make. The first thing here, we can check whether this library is up to date, we can report it if it's uh, out of date library, has known vulnerabilities, whatever. The second thing we can do is we can just ask the question, is the query, does it contain untrusted data? If it does, let's report a vulnerability to the developer so that they can go fix it. This is a pretty convenient way for them to get alerted of a new vulnerability, right? They didn't have to run any scans, they didn't have to do any extra work, they just get feedback right in their code. Hold on just a second. And then the last thing we can do is we can see, is this query an attack? And what we can do is we can actually check to see if the untrusted data that came in, did it modify the meaning of the query? 
Like, did it actually change the semantics of the query? Because no user should ever be able to change the semantics of the query. If it does, it has to be an attack, because that should never happen. And if it does, then we can report that injection attack, and we can prevent that query from going to the database. We can throw an exception here, which will jump out of this execute query method. Your app will keep running just fine, but it stays safe. The query never went to the database. OK, uh, a question over here. I will take some at the end, but let's go ahead now. It's uh, more fun for everybody. Yeah, so there's a couple of reasons for that, but uh, SCA is typically done statically. And if you run it on a code repo, you're going to miss a lot of libraries that are here in the production environment. Uh, many libraries that are important to security come from the runtime. They come from the platform or the app server uh, or the framework, uh, that, and they're not always present in the code repo. So you'll miss a lot of important things. That's a big reason. The other thing is uh, you'll know exactly what library actually made it into production, and you can tell which ones are actually used. Turns out 62% of open source libraries are never loaded, never, never invoked. So we want to know which ones those are, because there's no point in fixing libraries that are never even loaded into memory. They're not a risk. Those are false positives that SCA tools uh, report. OK, uh, so these are, these are lightweight checks. These are very fast. And if you think about how something like a WAF or a SAS tool works, they're expensive. They have to do a lot of work to figure out all the context that this has automatically by, the, by virtue of where it's running. So this is, these checks can be you know, incredibly fast, much faster than uh, you could do in other ways. OK. Um, oh, so these are the three checks that I talked about. So my slides will be available for everybody, by the way. Um, so when you start heading down this path, you probably want to ask yourself, like, hey, is this a better way than actually fixing the code? Do we really have to go back and fix those SQL queries? And look, for defense in depth purposes, I think the answer is yes. You probably ought to go keep doing secure coding practices. But this actually has a number of advantages. If you use parameterized queries, like prepared statements to fix SQL injection, do you know you're being attacked? No. You just defuse the attack, right? You make it safe data, but you'll never know that you're being attacked. I actually think it's important to know that you're being attacked. You guys agree? Yeah. But if you just use all the secure coding practices at, at OWASP, you'll never know that you're being attacked. You'll never see those attacks. You'll just kind of make them go away, which is, uh, I think, dangerous. So we want to know that we're being attacked. This, this approach actually has a number of benefits beyond that. Uh, I think there's some people benefits. Like, uh, this approach can eliminate a lot of the, the awful work of AppSec, like weeding out false positives and things like that. This tends to be really accurate in terms of what it reports because of where it's located. Um, we can make security work a lot better, and we can get QA and security teams working together because now their interests are aligned. Uh, this happened, you know, this kind of Analysis happens automatically as you use the application in development and in production. So it, a lot of it happens without that awful security work. Um, it can also change some aspects of the process that we use. This is sort of instant feedback back to developers right through the tools they're already using. So it's a very, very clean way of giving feedback. I, uh, I'm not a big fan of PDF reports. I think if you have them, you should banish them and move to real-time notifications for security. Uh, events. And from a technology perspective, uh, there's a few advantages. This is, uh, you know, it's a distributed approach, so you don't need any extra infrastructure. Everyone can do this on their own. Uh, and like I mentioned, the fix is in kind of one place, as opposed to trying to make this fix in a thousand places. So let's do some uh, rapid fire examples here. This is unsafe deserialization. It's uh, an important vulnerability. It's in a lot of different frameworks. Uh, you can see a serialized object at the top, the attacker sends it in. Normally, it would go into the deserialization engine, 
And as the engine deserializes that code, it will create a bunch of objects. To do that, it has to call the constructors on those objects. And many constructors contain code. Well, guess what? If you find the right objects to deserialize, you can find constructors that do interesting, weird things. Those are called gadgets. And we can make a gadget chain that results in us having the ability to execute arbitrary code. So what do we do to fix it? We add a trust boundary. Here we're gonna add an untrusted data boundary. All that says is we're never gonna deserialize any data that comes from an untrusted source. It's always dangerous. Uh, so we don't wanna have applications that do that. We should warn developers if they do it, and we should prevent it if we see it in a production application. So again, super simple check that eliminates a whole category of vulnerabilities. <laughs> That's the goal here, is we wanna stamp these vulnerabilities out. You know I wrote the first OWASP top 10 in 2002? It's been 20 years. We're still talking about SQL injection. It's making me crazy. We gotta find some ways of stamping these whole classes of vulnerabilities out. And by the way, you don't necessarily have to do this with instrumentation. We could go to all the people that are writing frameworks and libraries and uh, platforms and ask them nicely to put these kind of trust boundaries in their code. But I don't think it's ever gonna, and everybody's shaking their head like that's not gonna work. And it's not gonna work. <laughs> We've been trying for a long time to influence those teams, but it's, it's not gonna work. So if we wanna do this, we've gotta inject this code and enhance these capabilities ourselves. Uh, another example, expression language injection. This was the root cause of Equifax and uh, one of the ways Spring for Shell and Log for Shell were exploited. Uh, it's a really powerful attack. Basically, it's just untrusted data that comes in and ends up in an expression language engine, and then the expression language engine evaluates that expression, and in the, you can see there's an expression that will result in RCE, right? That just runs native code. So it's pretty simple. Um, but what if we're getting that, I, I made this example specifically because the untrusted data barrier here won't work, because we get data from other sources. Uh, what if we get this data from an MQ that we, quote, trust, right? We're not gonna treat that data as untrusted data. It came from a sort of a trusted source, but it could still have attacks in it. And so I want you to have a secondary set of, of defenses here. I'll call this one an unsafe uh, function boundary. This is more like a sandbox. What this says is, as long as you're inside the expression language engine, you can't call things that are dangerous, like creating sockets and running native processes and opening files and stuff. If you think about it, expressions shouldn't be used for that stuff anyway, right? Expressions are for like accessing data out of a bean, things like that, mostly for UI purposes. So we can sandbox the expression engine and prevent it from doing harmful things, even if we don't know that the data coming in is trusted. Okay, so we, now we've got kind of a, a roof and a floor on our dangerous function so that we can both prevent bad stuff going in and we can prevent dangerous calls going out. Here's another example. Uh, I like this example a lot. So anybody heard of XXE? XML uh, entity? Uh, so here you can see a, a untrusted XML document coming in and you can see it's got a doc type header in it that defines its own entity named foo, or oh, sorry, it's named XXE, and that uh, directive tells it to translate it into the contents of the password file, okay? Then in the XML document itself, the bottom line that says foo, XXE, foo, that when it's rendered by the XML parser, it will pull in the contents of the password file and include it in the XML document, and then it, you know, in most cases, you can figure out a way to get it back out of uh, the application to the user. So how do we solve it? Well, if we ask developers to do it, we gotta tell them to figure out how to disable doc type processing with your particular XML parser, and there's like a zillion different configuration parameters in every different XML parser to do it, and it's complicated. Uh, so people mess it up a lot. but. With runtime protection, we can do this automatically. 
we can just tell the parser, disable uh, doc type processing. And because we're inside the app, we know what parser it is. We can choose the right directive. We can disable doc type processing and we're safe. Everybody see how that's going to completely protect me against XXE? Anybody? Yeah. Right. But again, the path of, of us figuring something out and trying to coerce the developers into doing something in the code isn't working. At best, it's a super noisy path. I'll tell you, so when I was a consultant, uh, I did tons of pen tests and code reviews, wrote up lots of findings for developers, tried to be really specific about what they needed to do to fix the problem. 40% fail rate in making the fix that we told them to do. So on retest, 40% fail rate. And I'd be surprised if that changed. I think I'm pretty good at writing up findings and telling them how to fix the problem, but it just, it, that channel is noisy. <laughs> so I'm trying to suggest a better channel. Like, can we do this automatically? Can we digitally transform that process of changing the code to do what we want it to do? Uh, here's, I think this is my last example. Uh, this is an interesting one in, in Java. Uh, there's a, uh, if the application uses reflection to uh, load classes, you can trick that mechanism into loading arbitrary classes uh, and getting untrusted code to, to run. So uh, what we want to do is uh, prevent reflection from accessing uh, um, from being able to load uh, code from, uh, from untrusted sources. So uh, only bad guys use reflection to access the class loader. There's no reason why a developer would ever have to do that because developers can just ask for the class loader. It's available in every single class. You can say get class dot get class loader. <laughs> everywhere you are. So there's no reason to use reflection to access the class loader. But it's something that attackers use all the time because the first step in their attack is to get a hold of the class loader and then use the class loader to load their malicious code. So what do we do? We don't allow that. We, we say it, we can't use reflection to access the class loader anymore. So we can put a simple check in to prevent any access to class loaders via reflection. Uh, pretty easy. This solves a bunch of different attack vectors, including Spring for Shell. Uh, if you had this simple check, th those exploits would not have worked at all. Uh, so this is powerful. Um, here's those uh, five types of trust boundaries that I talked about. Untrusted data boundary. Uh, semantic integrity boundary was the SQL one, where we actually checked the semantics of the SQL query. Unsafe function boundary. Uh, Defense enablement, that was the XXE one, and band behavior boundary was the last one with uh, reflection and class loading. Any questions on any of those trust boundaries? Everybody understand those? Yeah, Grant. Three and five are very close, very similar, right? Same sort of approach. Yes, that's right. Yep. Um, there are other ones. So different kinds of vulnerabilities, like for CSRF, for instance, there's a different kind of boundary that you might want to put in place. Um, but it's not hard to imagine these, these boundaries that you can put into the dangerous function and, uh, and enforce. So SSRF is another good one. What would you do to stop SSRF? Anybody want to suggest how you'd stop SSRF? Which one of those boundaries you'd use? Yeah. Well, first of all, where would you put it? If you wanted to put a trust boundary in place to prevent all SSRF, where would you put it? Yeah. In, yeah, you're right. It's one. That's the boundary that you'd use. And where would you put that boundary? Like, what dangerous function would you put it in? Remember, SSRF works by creating a connection to a back-end system via a HTTP request typically, but it could be via a socket or something else. 
It's any, anything that your app does to generate that backend request. So how do people generate backend requests? Yeah, oh, sorry, uh, a little blind. Exactly right. There's typically some HTTP client available, and you don't want to accept URLs with an untrusted data chunk in them. Uh, so that would be a good place um, to, to solve SSRF. It's a little tricky, but uh, there's, there's a few corner cases there, but that's what these boundaries are about. That's how we stamp them out forever. Okay. I mentioned you can also use runtime protection for library security. I just wanted to be, uh, you know, sort of close the loop on that. Runtime protection can do three things to help you with securing your libraries. I know that's sort of uh, on everybody's uh, list of things they're working on now. So with runtime protection, you can instantly analyze all the libraries that are available to your environment and then which ones are actually used. So you get a great inventory of what's there. Then you can look at them and say, hey, do those libraries have both known vulnerabilities? Now, that's just a database lookup, right? Once you've identified it, it's pretty easy to tell it doesn't have any known vulnerabilities. But runtime protection can also find unknown vulnerabilities in those libraries. So if your library is using uh, one of these dangerous functions unsafely, runtime protection can tell you about it. And you can find zero days, and you can make millions of dollars in bug bounties and things like that. Um, so it's not just for CVEs. Library protection, like the big hole in library protection is like nobody's looking for the unknown vulnerabilities in libraries. Everybody's just scrambling to fix the tiny percentage of things we've already found. And then uh, on the protect side, you can actually not only find known and unknown vulnerabilities, but you can prevent them from being exploited. So... Uh, you know, I know lots of customers that are using runtime protection that were safe through log for shell and spring for shell and the Atlassian vulnerabilities. And uh, even just a couple weeks ago, there was a new kind of SQL injection that someone discovered that bypassed all the WAFs out there that included some JSON in the query. And WAFs weren't picking up on it because it's sort of a different kind of signature. But the approach that I've just laid out, no problem it sees that the meaning of the query was modified and reports uh, a attack. So this protects not only against today's vulnerabilities, but most of tomorrow's. Like most of the zero days that people report that are gonna come out in the next year or two, could be today, we don't know, uh, they're gonna be in one of the categories that we've just talked about, right? They're gonna be expression language injection or XXE or something like that. If they're not, uh, then we've got to think about what trust boundary we'd put in place to, to solve that one too, right? So we're security people, right? Let's talk about the dangers of this approach because uh, I think a lot of people are sometimes concerned. They're like, wait a minute, you're adding, you're going to enhance all these libraries with extra code? That sounds kind of dangerous. Anybody think that? Okay, that's fair. Um, so let's, let's think about it. Do you want to detect attacks? Okay, so that's something you want to do. So let's talk about dangers then, right? You could rely on your developers to try to report attacks, but uh, nobody does that. They're never going to do that. So right away, you're looking at very weak protection in that category, right? I looked at kind of three categories, like performance impact, reliability problem, or weak protection. And in all cases where you let your developers do it, you're probably not in good territory. <laughs> it's actually pretty hard to do this reliably across uh, a large portfolio of apps. Uh, your second option is you could use a web app firewall, right? Uh, no, I mean, there's, there's some performance impact to using a WAF. It's not terrific. Uh, I think there's efficient ways of doing that. But, uh, you know, it is an extra hop and it's sort of, it's network, uh, it, it, you have to change your network architecture a little bit. Uh, but WAFs are known to break apps, right? You have to tune them to every application because some, some data that your application's processing probably looks like attacks. Matter of fact, look at an HTTP request lately. It all looks like attacks. Um, so it ends up you need to tune it, uh, turn them off uh, a lot. And actually, that's probably maybe the, the most dangerous thing is people turn off WAFs all the time. They're just sitting there in monitor mode. They're not really doing anything. They're not often tailored and uh, they're often bypassable. 
with WAFs, there's something called the, uh, the, uh, um, blanket on the name. So the data impedance problem. That's, that's right. Anyway, uh, sorry, sidetrack. Uh, but anyway, WAFs don't see the data the same way the application sees the data, right? Like the WAFs probably written in C, applications written in Java or .NET or Ruby or something, and it views the data differently. And so that creates a lot of corner cases uh, for bypasses. But think about runtime protection. We've gone through some of the advantages. It's a simple, testable check. You can deploy it uh, as part of your application. Even before production, you can put this into your, you know, into your development environments, have it go through all your test cases, make sure your application works with protection enabled. Uh, and uh, the protection that it provides is much stronger than you can get from these other techniques. So uh, my experience with runtime protection has been very good. There's, uh, I, I'll tell you, there's only one time that I know of that RASP broke an application. And it's when the application was sending full SQL queries from the client to the server. That was like how it worked. And RASP said, no, <laughs> that's untrusted data that's going directly into the SQL query. We're going to block that. Um, but that was the way that app happened to work. It's SQL injection by design. So I'm not sure if that counts. But uh, I think by far the biggest risk here is not using runtime protection. If you're not using it at all, then you're likely pretty wide open to attack, and you probably have no idea that you're being attacked. And that's a dangerous place to be. That's where I don't want people to be. So to me, that's a much bigger risk than the very low risk that you're going to have a, a performance or a reliability or security kind of problem. Does it make sense? How's my logic? I'm OK. Uh, <laughs> So I want you to imagine I want to check my time here. Uh, let me know what time it is. OK, perfect. OK, so I want you to imagine that you've innate, like this is a scale challenge, right? So lots of organizations I work for have hundreds or thousands of applications. So how are you going to protect them becomes a problem of how are you going to scale. And I want you to imagine that you make runtime protection part of your platform. Really, in most cases, it's like you're adding another library. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, our RASP is a jar file for Java. We support a broad range of languages. Um, so there's RASP for all these different environments. But I just want you to imagine putting RASP as part of your platform. It rolls out across your environments. RASP doesn't care if it's running in a container or in the cloud or in a data center. It's running at the application level. It's literally a different way of programming your applications, right? So at the end of the day, it's just we've, we've just changed the code of the application to include these new trust boundaries. We just programmed it differently. We had the developers write one big chunk of the code, and we wrote the, the trust boundaries, and we merged them together at runtime. Uh, that's the essence of aspect-oriented programming. That's a, uh, it's, this kind of technique is used in a lot of frameworks already. I would guarantee you that you're already using instrumentation in almost all of your applications under the hood because it's a technique that many frameworks use. So just imagine, I got now I've got all my applications are protected and the telemetry starts coming in. We've seen on average applications and APIs get attacked 13,000 times a month. 99% of those attacks never reach their intended uh, target, their intended vulnerability. Right? So you see SQL injection attacks that don't go anywhere near a SQL query. Path traversal attacks that never go anywhere near a file open. XXE attacks that never go anywhere uh, XML parsing. So it's really useful to know which of those attacks are just harmless probes and which of them actually make it to the vulnerability that they were trying to exploit. Those are where you want to focus your efforts. And if you think about it, if you see attacks on a vulnerability, what happens to the risk? Does it go down? Yeah, it goes way up, right? Now it's not hypothetical that it could be attacked sometime in the future. Or you know, maybe you've got a complex path to reach that vulnerability. Well, guess what? They figured it out. So now the risk is like 100% that it's going to be attacked 
because it just was. And then you can think about the, the severity of the, that attack, but it changes the risk dynamically when you have this kind of threat intelligence feeding back into your security and development programs. And I want you to complete that loop. You're, you're not convinced? I would argue that it can change the risk and made it more viable because before it was in, and now it's yeah, right? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think people would say like, uh, you know, it's an XXE, it's, uh, it's in an admin function or something, it's, it's hard to exploit. They would say the likelihood is low. But once you see it actually attacked, now the likelihood's high. So it's, it is about uncertainty when you get right down to it. Like a risk measurement with no data is like, oh, it's somewhere in this area. <laughs> but once you start getting data, you can quantify it. That lets you prioritize and focus your program on the risks that matter. So I want you to imagine you've got this, uh, all your apps are instrumented. They're reporting data, real-time telemetry, both to development so they got vulnerabilities and threat intelligence coming into the development process. This is all instant feedback, so you can make fixes as part of the normal development process. And we're feeding information into production. So if there's attacks that uh, the production needs to respond to, you know, we, we block them, but hey, now we know that that IP address is an attacker. <laughs> and that we might even know the, the user account that's associated with that attack, because maybe they were logged in when they were doing these attacks. So we can feed that back and say, hey, uh, user, either you're an attacker or someone stole your account. We're going to make you change your password and, I don't know, send the cops over your house or whatever. Uh, you can respond. So this is a much, much more powerful way of thinking about application layer attacks. Most organizations are pretty blind when it comes to attack traffic at the application layer. They don't see it. Uh, WAF traffic is just too noisy. Um, so uh, this is, I think, a really powerful capability. And it's totally distributed, so it, it scales. I'll tell you a quick story, and uh, then we'll wrap up. So uh, uh, I worked with uh, a Fortune 100 company on a RASP implementation. They did something interesting. They said, hey, we've got these 20 applications. Uh, we want to. We want to test them for security. So they found 1,600 vulnerabilities across these applications. And they said, uh, that's interesting. How many of those would runtime protection have solved for us? And so we dug in and we studied all 1,600 of these vulnerabilities. And the answer we came up with was 95% uh, of them, leaving only 76 vulnerabilities that runtime protection wouldn't have protected them against being exploited for. That's really powerful. That means, I mean, imagine if you could take 95% of your vulnerability backlog off the table, or at least put it on the back burner, like lower the risk of it, uh, change the priority of it. That's fundamentally changing the dynamics of your AppSec program. So I think this is an important path forward. And they mandated, based on those results, they mandated run prime protection across all of their apps and APIs. Uh, personally, I wouldn't put anything on the internet that doesn't have runtime protection in it because I wouldn't have the visibility and I wouldn't have any protection. Uh, so I think it's the smart way forward. Uh, if you want to play around with RASP, I made an open source tool that will allow you to experiment with instrumentation on your own. Uh, it's called JOT, the Java Observability Toolkit. And it's designed to let you create your own instrumentation without having to write any code. So you can see this is a, what I call a JOT. It's a YAML file that defines where the sensors go, like what methods they go in, what scope they apply to. You'll have to read the docs about that. And then uh, what you want to do, either capture, which is like what information do I want to extract from that sensor, or what action do you want to take? Like, do you want to throw an exception uh, when that sensor fires? So this simple bit of code implements the trust boundary that we talked about for expression language injection. This says that while you're evaluating an expression, we won't allow any calls to create a socket or create a native process. So we created a sandbox around the expression language injection engine and made it safe. So again, this would have prevented a, a bunch of different attacks that have, have come out. 
Jada is really flexible. You can use Jada for monitoring just about anything that's going on in your Java application. Uh, any method you want to check out, it, uh, uh, there's a bunch of examples, and I've done some other talks on it, but if you want to know what encryption your application is using, uh, like a two-line Jot will just tell you all the sense, all the ciphers that you're using anywhere in your stack. Uh, you can figure out all the access control checks anywhere in your stack and create an access control matrix. There's a bunch of things you can do with Jot, but it's a way of playing around with runtime protection yourself, and I encourage you to experiment with it and let me know what you build with it because uh, we can make it part of a community that, that focuses on this. Uh, any, any questions on Jot? It's super fun. I mean, I guarantee you, you have no idea how much MD5 is out there. It's stupefying. Uh, we'll never be rid of it. Okay, so let's go back to where I started. So who wants to trust their uh, everything they care about in their life to getting developers to do the right thing? Who wants to trust everything in their life that's important to a perimeter protection? WAF guy, love him. Uh, and who would now consider using runtime protection to automatically warn about insecure code, analyze libraries, and detect and prevent exploits? Anybody? All right, let's look at half the room. That's awesome. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll stop, and I'd love to answer any questions about this or anything related to application security. I'd, I'd love you to try to stump me. I'm going to come back to you in a second. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, how much overhead does Rust add to the uh, application and all the services? Yeah, it depends on uh, how many trust boundaries you put in place and how complicated they are. Uh, you can put in a bunch of trust boundaries that have almost no performance impact. As they get more complicated, uh, it can have more of a, an impact. Um, but certainly, Faster than a WAF, I think, is a good way of thinking about it. Um, Do you have any data on that? Oh, yeah. But that's for my company's product, which is not, I mean, I'm talking about RASP in general here. There's a bunch of products in the market. Some are probably faster than others. Uh, I encourage you to test it. But I will say that uh, I think from you know, a performance perspective, having your developers try to put this, these kind of checks in, you'll end up with something that's dramatically slower. Uh, because they, they'll do things in naive ways, like they'll use regexes to check inputs, uh, and they'll do redundant checks in multiple places and, and things like that. So uh, from a performance perspective, if you want to detect attacks, there's going to be some kind of penalty. The question is, which approach has the smallest penalty for the most benefit? Okay? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's sub-millisecond, like, is a good rule of thumb. Yeah, And, and again, uh, you know, look, there's, there's a lot of RAS products. If you use Jot, like that, that sensor I just put there is essentially free. You could, I mean, there's, there's no possibility that you'll ever be able to measure the impact of that sensor. It depends on what rules you put in place and which, uh, you know, which trust boundaries you're trying to enforce. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll come around. Yeah. 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 There's less maintenance than you think, actually. Uh, so you know, I've looked at like this, the Java servlet spec uh, and the JDBC spec and things like they don't change very dramatically. Like the the main methods that you'd want to instrument haven't changed in years. Um, so it it is true that uh, they they could change, um, but mostly these things get locked in. They're pretty low down in the stack. And so things get built on top of them, and they depend on those APIs not changing. And so 
they don't tend to change very much. So I think the lower you go, the, the more stable those uh, kind of trust boundaries can be. The top of the stack is always like the, the Wild West, right? So that's what we're trying to do here, really. So we're trying to take things that work, that we've discovered in the top of the stack, push them down into a layer where we can enforce them consistently forever. Yeah, there's a question here. Yeah. Yeah, it's just uh, easier. Uh, writing wrappers isn't always convenient, uh, and you can't always get what you need from a wrapper because many times you need to access the inner state of the the library itself. Um, Uh, I mean, it, it really depends, this is related to his question. Like, that stuff doesn't change that much. Um, it's my experience, so, yeah. You could also, by the way, you don't have to write wrappers, you could actually uh, compile in these trust boundaries during the build process. You could transform the binary, and then they'd already be there, when you pushed it to production. But what we found is that uh, it's easier to add uh, th this instrumentation at runtime than to try to do it during the build process. Because uh, it, com it uh, adds complexity to the build. So, yeah. Oh uh, yeah, great, uh, great question. Uh, that does take some work. Um, you can trace untrusted data through an application, like, you know, when it comes from an untrusted API, like request.getParameter, you can tag that data, and then wherever it goes, you can track it. If it ends up in a SQL query, uh, you can say, hey, that tainted the SQL query. Uh, so there's, there's levels of, of sophistication of taint tracking, and uh, for, you know, there's, there's some trade-offs there, but uh, it's definitely possible. Yeah, that, that's one of the things that makes, like, Jot can't do that. Like, that's, <laughs> Jot is relatively simple instrumentation. You can put in some simple trust boundaries. Uh, more sophisticated commercial tools can do much more interesting things. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, if you find a SQL injection vulnerability, should you fix it? Should you use runtime protection? Or what was the third thing? Both. Or both, yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, it depends a little bit on how you're set up. For most organizations, I think first, runtime protection. Get the protection in place so you're safe and you have some cover while you fix issues. Then, go fix it. I think code hygiene is actually important. That's why I included the piece about reporting back to developers that they're using this dangerous function unsafely, even though we put a trust boundary in that makes it safe. Uh, it, that way, you know, for some reason they want to stop using RASP or uh, you know they they change their stack or something, and you know their code ends up being safe. Yeah, but runtime protection first. <laughs> which is a little different than, uh, you know, for most organizations, because most organizations have a lot of unfixed vulnerabilities, lots of them, in libraries and custom code. So we got to tackle that first. And I, I don't think it's safe to take, you know, five years to go back and work off the vulnerability backlog. So, yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah, it is very similar. Open telemetry is awfully cool. They're making instrumentation for performance purposes and observability purposes standard. Uh, so 
it, it is absolutely conceivable that those two things merge together. Gardner first wrote about that concept, I don't know, at least a decade ago, and it hasn't really happened yet. So I don't know. I mean, it's, I can speak from experience. It's a lot of work to create a, you know, a company and a rule set around how to do IAS and RASP effectively. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure it's a lot of work to build an observability company. So I don't know. Maybe they just haven't uh, come together as a market yet. But it, it, it definitely could. Open telemetry is really cool. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, well, in terms of uh, the runtime environment, I think it's, a, a lot of organizations have a cloud WAF or something like that, which isn't a terrible idea. It can weed out a lot of the low-hanging fruit, and you know, it, it, there's nothing wrong with having a fairly generic cloud WAF or something. But for real protection, I think having RASP in the app is the right thing to do. Um, in terms of what you put in your pipeline to make sure that your code is uh, secure, I think, well, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge advocate of I asked, I mean, I asked uses the same technology to test for vulnerabilities while the application is being going, going through QA testing. Uh, it's, uh, it's much more accurate and fast than uh, sort of traditional scanning type solutions. So that's what I would put all my chips on. Any other questions? I don't know how we're doing on time. I'll say again? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, and I am going to come back here. OK, yeah, sure. Yeah, you don't need, developers don't need to do anything to their code. Uh, essentially, you add the, I, I tried to put in this picture, uh, basically you just add this, um, this runtime protection engine to your application. It, and it, it works exactly the way New Relic or AppDynamics works. You add a performance engine or whatever. Here you're adding this runtime protection engine and it instruments the code as it loads. So this, uh, is literally what happens, like as the bytecode loads, or uh, we do this for all languages, so it's different mechanisms. I'm just kind of sticking to Java here, but as that code loads, we add in some code that wasn't in the source code. We're adding it in as the code loads, but at the end, the code looks as though it was written like this by the developer, just the developer didn't have to do it. That's what I was trying to say earlier when I said, hey, developers write this code, and then someone else security and some other developers write some security trust boundaries and we merge them together at runtime into the actual thing that executes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Play with Jot, you can, uh, so there's a free version of Contrast Community Edition that you can get an account on. You can add our agent to your applications and uh, test with Zap and see if you can attack your application and uh, RASP will, runtime protection will identify those attacks and prevent you from being exploited, even on a vulnerable app. Yeah, it's a good way to get started. And maybe a good way to stop, because I think I'm at the end of my time, so. Yeah. Appreciate it, everybody. Thank you. Um, I'll be around uh, today and uh, tonight. We are having a, a, what do you call it? Happy hour at BrewDog uh, at 6 o'clock. We'd love to have you join us. Thanks. Yep.